introduced by me, Elsa Partian. Oh, very welcome. So over to Gary to kick us off with the questions, please, Gary. Well, I, I, please introduce yourself, Heather. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Excited to be with you guys. I think this is one of the uh, fun side effects, I guess, of our current situation is that we're all experimenting with what we can do with virtual events. And it means that you guys can be in the UK and I can be in the US and we can all still be having a conversation and, and doing the virtual version of an event together. Um, I guess if I were to introduce myself, I would say I am a scientist turned storyteller. I started my career uh, getting a PhD in biology, in marine biology, uh, and along the way realized that the lab, and for that matter, even in the field, doing the experiments wasn't really where I was meant to be. What I really loved was the stories um, inside and around science. And so I kind of jumped tracks and I spent 12 years as a journalist uh, interviewing hundreds of scientists and helping them tell their stories, and then recently made another shift um, to work with Woods Hole Research Center in a communications role there because uh, quite frankly, I had done plenty of reporting on climate change, but was really just feeling like I needed to be giving 100% of my professional effort to uh, telling stories that could actually drive change, the change that we really need to address the climate crisis. Well, um, I, hope, I hope that we do you justice. You're a great interviewer. I was listening to um, your podcast, 800 interviews with with brilliant minds. A lot of things that I've, I've gotten to learn, a lot of interesting people that I got to interview over the years uh, during my journalism career and, uh, you know, doing, doing something a little bit different now with Woods Hole Research Center, but now surrounded by several dozen uh, really interesting and really intelligent climate scientists who are completely dedicated to understanding the world's climate system and uh, not just doing that science, but both doing that science with an eye toward possible solutions and then making sure that that information gets to the people who can use it to, to make the change we need. So I've got a question for you, Heather, on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, what I've read is that for the last four years, the Woods Hole Research Center has been named as the top climate change research center in the world. So amongst all these, uh, these, these wonderful minds, I'd be really interested to hear what for you is one of the top one or two things, top one or two insights that, uh, that you like, that you've um, found since you joined the, the center. Right. Yeah, you're referring to the fact that uh, we've been rated the number one climate change think tank, I think four years in a row, as you said, which is uh, an interesting, uh, you know, it's, it's a wonderful honor, uh, kind of interesting, because I think one of the things that drew me to Woods Hole Research Center is the fact that there's no one descriptor that really encompasses what we do. Think tank probably doesn't quite encapsulate it. It's that combination, as I said, of research and trying to put that into action um, through talking with policymakers, talking with the public, uh, working with partners. And I think some of our work with partners is, is some of the most uh, innovative and interesting work that we do, where whether it's looking at uh, the ability of uh, agricultural soils to absorb carbon, or our work in the Amazon or the Congo with forests, or for that matter, some of our newer work looking at the physical risks of climate change, what it will actually look like in 2030, 2040, 2050, in terms of uh, temperatures or precipitation and what that translates to in terms of our ability to work or to move around, uh, what that means for our economy. All of this is work that's coming out of really close partnerships um, and kind of outside the box partnerships where it's not just collaborating with academic colleagues or other colleagues at nonprofits, but working with members of the private sector and, and in some cases, um, major influencers in the private sector. Um, earlier this year, back in January, uh, McKinsey and Company, largest consulting company in the, in the world, released a report that Woods Hole Research Center contributed the analysis of physical climate risk for their analysis of the economic and socioeconomic risks, again, in the near term, in this kind of 2030 to 2050 realm, not looking decades and decades out, but something that a lot of us will see in our lifetime. And so I think that kind of work is, is really, really important. But then on the other, I don't know if it's end of the spectrum, we've also got really exciting work, um, really deeply embedded in the natural world and looking at the potential for natural climate solutions and also some of the risks 
um, of emissions from natural ecosystems as, as we warm the planet and ecosystems change, places that have been sinks of carbon, that have been sucking up carbon and storing it in the past, whether that's forests or the permafrost in the Arctic, some of those are shifting. We're reaching tipping points where they're now becoming sources of carbon to the atmosphere. Okay. And so we're really looking at those systems to try to figure out where are the potential solutions and where are some of the risks. I, I think the one I'm particularly interested in really is this permafrost one, because um, I've, I've known for some years now that there is a, a tipping point, that there, is a, there is a risk around the permafrost. So, as I understand it, this is one of those things where, you know, you read about a tipping point and we're, we're so used to the Hollywood version of life where at the last minute someone comes in and saves the situation, it's all okay. But with this, with this permafrost tipping point, as I understand it, and it'd be good if you can, you can clarify this to, to try and um, put this into human terms for people. But as I understand it, once this really kicks off, then the thing, becomes unstoppable because the the methane going into the air increases the temperature of the world which increases the risk of the permafrost melting and basically this is something which has as i understand it really has no no solution there's no, there's nothing that can come in and stop this but anyway you you you're the expert you <laughs> correct me on this one right so i don't know that it's so much of a, co a correction or refinement let's take a step back to the beginning of the process so permafrost kind of short for permanently frozen ground in the Arctic, which unfortunately I've, I've now heard people making kind of dark jokes about, you know, it's then a frost or sometimes a frost. It's not really permanent anymore. What has happened is that that ground, which is incredibly rich in carbon, right? It's, it's ground that is peat from marshes and trees that that has been turned into soil and, and that carbon has been locked there frozen for thousands of years. And as the planet is warming and the Arctic is warming uh, faster than most of the rest of the planet, which is a different set or a related set of processes we can talk about, but as it's rapidly warming, that permafrost is starting to thaw. And as it does that, it can release greenhouse gases. You mentioned methane, also potentially carbon dioxide. Um, and the, the threat there is that that permafrost holds more uh, carbon than is already in the atmosphere, right? And what you were referring to is this feedback loop. As we warm, it thaws more, there's more release of, of greenhouse gases, which causes more warming, which causes more melting, and you just end up in this vicious cycle. And I wouldn't say that there's no solution, but there's certainly no switch that we can flip that will just turn that off. The solution is that we have to decrease global carbon emissions to limit that warming and slow down the whole global process. So there's no switch we can flip, but what this really highlights, and, and maybe I'll introduce the, the coronavirus parallel theme here for the day with this, right, is that we have the science to see what is coming and we can project what is likely to happen in the future and what those risks are. And we need to act on those projections now, because once that starts to happen, it's too late. It's very much like the coronavirus outbreak that once you've got coronavirus, as we're now unfortunately all familiar with, once you've got it spreading in a community, it's really hard to put that back in the box, right? You have to act before that when there are projections that you could start to see infections in your community. And that can be a really hard thing to do, right? To say, well, everything's fine now, but it's going to get really bad. So I need to take really dramatic action now. Why can't I wait till it gets bad? Um, and I think what we're learning, hopefully, from this pandemic is that no, when we get these kinds of warnings from scientists that this is what is likely to happen down the road, we need to actually be heeding those warnings and acting early. I think scientists will be taken a little bit more seriously. The politicians tend to just say, brush over the detail, five or 10% either way. Uh, they say, this is quite a shock, I think, to a lot of politicians. Heather, can I ask you, you're such a calm, wonderful person. What got you into science and your love for the environment? I would have to trace that back to being 12 years old. And, and there must have been some underlying interest because I went to a three week summer camp run by a fabulous group called the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, a nonprofit. And they took a dozen 12 and 13 year olds on a small working boat, basically camping our way 
all the way from the headwaters of the Chesapeake Bay down to the mouth of the bay. Uh, camping along the way, doing water quality testing. Uh, I encountered my first composting toilet on that trip. <laughs> um, got to learn about the crabbing industry and about the threats to the oyster industry and the declining uh, populations of both crabs and oysters in the bay. And I came back from that three week summer camp experience just completely uh, inspired and, and looked at my mom at a, as a 12 year old and just said, I, the oceans are in trouble, I have to save the oceans. Now obviously fast forward 30 years and there have been twists and turns that that love of the ocean remains. I live about two miles from the ocean and can't imagine um, moving away from the ocean even though that's not what I'm doing on a daily basis right now, studying the ocean or, or reporting on the ocean all of the time. But it, that, that's really what got me started. And uh, I should say, you know, that's what really sustained me through graduate school, although I was Definitely interested in the environment. Um, I wasn't doing anything related to climate change at that point. My awareness of climate change and, and real interest, professional interest in the climate change issue happened very early in my journalism stint, um, talking to some fisheries biologists uh, here in Woods Hole and asking them, okay, what are we going to see in terms of impacts on our, our fisheries here in New England. I mean, New England, I, I live on Cape Cod, right? Named for Cod, named for fisheries. What's going to happen? And what they told me just completely took me by surprise, which it took me by surprise on two levels. They, what they told me was that half of all commercially fished species had already significantly shifted where they're found in the ocean as a result of changing water temperatures and that that was just going to continue and that we were also likely to see declines in in total harvests and i looked at them and i said you mean this is already happening and this was in 2009 and and they said yes and so i was shocked just on one level that oh this is already happening it's not in the future i i had kind of gotten the message that this was in the future and then I had a deeper level of shock and surprise, which was, I'm a scientist living in Woods Hole, which is this crazy community with half a dozen different research organizations in this one tiny village immersed in science. How could I not know? And if I didn't know, that meant that so many other people definitely didn't know. And that's what really, um, I think, launched my, my passion for talking about I think you have a gift for communication. I've only known you a few days, really, and it's your non-science um, talking, I think, because we have a science community. And if you go out of that community, I think you can be re you're very relatable. So what, what kind of, if, you, if you could plan out the next four or five years, what, what would be your aim for you to communicate to the public, the non-scientific community? Well, that's, that's a really big question. Um, and I think, though, the answer is, is pretty simple and universal. And really what we need, um, and, and we don't even have five years to wait for this, what we need is for everyone to realize that... Um, while doing more science is absolutely critical for refining our understanding and figuring out which solutions will be best and where the greatest risks are and how great the threats are, the basic science that we need to drive action and to justify action, we already have that. We already know that climate change is happening. We already know that it's caused by human action, by the burning of fossil fuels. We already know that it causes uh, and w is causing and will continue to cause uh, deaths and economic harm and hardship. And we already have technologies and strategies that we can deploy to start combating it. And so that's what I really, um, you know, it, it doesn't take a PhD um, to know those things um, and to understand that. That is the basics of what the science, decades of science at this point, boils down to is we know we have this problem that we need to be addressing earlier rather than later. And we do have tools to do that. That was so beautifully put. Dare I say, I know Charles has got lots of questions too, but that word tipping point, that's the word that people are in denial about <laughs> because that, they'll be like, oh, we'll figure it out. But it, there is, there is a tipping point and we can't, how accurate can we make our prediction to where the tipping point is? 
Yeah, well, and, and those, that's definitely, I think, where uh, the cutting edge of a lot of the science is right now, that we know there are tipping points, there will be tipping points, exactly when we reach those is less certain. And in part, it's less certain because what scientists can't uh, predict and model for is what we do. Right. So scientists run these different climate models with different assumptions about how much greenhouse gases we actually put into the atmosphere, what our behavior is like. But until we actually know what that behavior is, we can't precisely predict when we will reach the tipping points. It, it depends on our, our human actions. Um, and again, that's another parallel to the coronavirus outbreak. Right. We can look at these predictions of how much will we flatten the curve and when will we reach the peak and when will it subside. And we can model that with a bunch of different assumptions, but in the end, the actual answer can't be known until we actually know, it, it, did we have 100% social distancing? Of course, we're never going to have perfect 100% quarantine and social distancing, but did we have 85% uh, you know, efficient or 50% efficient or only 25% efficient distancing? And, and that completely changes when you hit those tipping points. So Gary, there's a big comparison that I'd like to make, which is that the, you know, in a number of countries now and in a number of cities across the world, a climate and environmental emergency has been declared. So in, in the UK, we've got a, a climate and environmental emergency. Um, Heather, in parts of the US, you have, I think you have in New York, you have in uh, California, and you have in some other places as well. But the, what does that mean, particularly in the UK? I mean, in the UK now, we've got this, we've, we've had delivered by post, we've had this wonderful leaflet came in a few weeks, just a couple of weeks ago. Coronavirus, stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. Now, have we had this for climate change? We, we had an, we've had an emergency here since June. Um, we've got, a, a, within the UK, we've got um, hundreds, 200, 250 out of maybe 500 local authorities have declared an emergency. But have we had this type of, of leaflet and, and simple actions from any of these? And, and I think it, it, comes down to, um, it comes down to the basics. I mean, Heather eloquently outlined the fact that the science says there is there is a problem it's happening now and there will be a problem be a bigger problem so the science is very clear but it's the politicians who, who haven't leapt onto this and and so you know there are these it's turned out there are these communities we had uh, scientific um committees we have this wonderful committee in the uk called the science and um science and something expert committee so this expert committee is looking at coronavirus but I'm, I'm not aware that the committees looked at climate change, but actually does it need to? Because the, the UN and the IPCCC have been studying this for years. So as, as, as Heather says, it's very, actually very straightforward. So for me, it comes down to what are the, uh, what are the politicians going to do about this following coronavirus? And um, basically, what can we, each of us do? Um, each of us as citizens of the world do to get our local politician to join in and do something. This is a, it's a fundamental question. And for me, it comes down to look, what, what do we want? If, if we as individuals and enough of us say we want action on this, then, then it will, without a doubt, it will, it will happen. But if people keep uh, sitting back and saying, okay, well, it seems to be okay. I'll just, I'll just carry on. I'll, I'll carry on doing what I'm doing. Then, you know, we're never going to get there. So um, Gary, back over to you. Yeah, the big points there. You've written so many. I, yes. I would love to respond to that a little bit. I mean, I think yeah, please. A, a few thoughts occurred as you were saying that, Charles. And, and the first is that here in the U.S., we've seen an interesting um, parallel. I, I don't know that it's a you know an absolute ironclad correlation in a scientific sense, but um, some have noted that the governors, the state leaders, who are um, it putting forth some of the strongest climate change policies were also some of the ones who put forth the earliest and strongest responses to uh, the coronavirus outbreak. And uh, to me, that is uh, a symbol of, or, or a reflection of those who are, um, as we were talking about earlier, heeding the scientific advice that they're getting and willing to take action based on those 
projections, not waiting to, to see the worst happen before you actually act. Um, it, and to your point about, you know, will politicians take the lesson uh, or lessons of COVID-19 and, and move forward with more uh, appropriate action for an emergency, for a climate emergency, I think it needs to not only be politicians, but all of us um, learning that, that lesson because typically, and we, and we know this from public opinion polling as well, that even those who are most concerned about climate change, many of them still tend to think of it as a distant problem, uh, that it will affect someone else, somewhere else, some other time in the future. Not that it's going to, or that it is affecting them, themselves, their families, and their communities right now. I think that's changing. You know, we've, we've been throwing around this term tipping point, and there are tipping points in natural systems. There are also definitely social tipping points. And I think there's been a lot of discussion over the past few years of, are we hitting a tipping point? Extreme weather has become so extreme and so in our faces that we're seeing people start to connect the dots because they are seeing climate impacts in their backyards, in their communities, and starting to realize, oh, this is affecting me. Um, but we still have this lag time that even when we're declaring climate emergencies, we're, we're not acting like it's an emergency today or next week. We're still acting like it's an emergency next year. And maybe if we could see a silver lining in this pandemic, it would be um, a, a really widespread and collective realization of our vulnerability right, that unimaginably bad things can happen just because they haven't happened before doesn't mean that they will not happen. In, in, the, in the business world, they talk about 80% of the time should be the solution and 20% of the time should be the pro, um, how you solve the problem. So 80% the solution, 20% talking about the problem. So, so what are some of the solutions and has coronavirus been a game changer for the environment because i certainly speak to people who didn't care and then now they're saying that you see the earth is fighting back and yeah that's not very scientific but I, i'll take that as a start you know like that's great the the london air is is um the cleanest it's been for 70 years maybe people will get a taste for this so what are in what are the some of the solutions that we can kick into yeah, well, so, I mean, on that, that coronavirus theme and could this be a tipping point and a game changer, um, I think it has the potential to be a game changer in multiple different ways, both good and bad. Um, people are seeing that when we stop economic activity, we, we start seeing sometimes wildlife in the streets or we have cleaner air quality. So being able to make the connection between, oh, the actions that we take on a daily basis really impact our environment in a really um, powerful way and seeing that in a short-term way. Now that doesn't mean that uh, a, a six month or you know, even a year slowdown in emissions is going to solve the climate crisis by any means, but it's an awareness tool perhaps. I, you know, I think that's the silver lining is recognizing that we do have, not only that we're vulnerable, but the flip side of that, that we do have this power, that we have uh, taken what several weeks ago would in countries like the UK and the US have been unimaginable actions um, to address this crisis. And not that it's obviously without pain and hardship for many, many people. Um, we, we don't wanna say that an economic shutdown is, is what we wanna do for climate change. It's absolutely not. In fact, that poses threats to climate action. Um, in and of itself, but we're seeing that we have the power to do things that we didn't necessarily think we were capable or willing to do. And so maybe we can take out of that a sense of empowerment that we can transfer to, to working on climate change. And that in and of itself, I think, is um, as necessary and important a tool as wind turbines and solar panels, right? You've already alluded to this, Charles. It's political will is, is one of the biggest things yeah. that has been holding back the pace of climate action. And so if this can help create that sense of empowerment um, and will, then, then that is, is definitely a silver lining, at least. I think both of them are very important, um, Heather. I mean, you know, we've, we've lived in this golden age uh, where you know, this is maybe the first time that um, since World War II, um, where basically, you know, people are, people are facing this sort of, of crisis. I mean, in London, in World War II, people would go to bed and they may be blown up in their beds. 
Um, and, and with coronavirus, you know, you, you hear these stories of people who today are fine and then just within seven or eight days, they've, you know, they've actually gone through the full cycle and, and, and they're dead as a result of coronavirus. So the vulnerability, I think, is very important to, to, to people who've had this, this invulnerable, you know, this sort of James Bond syndrome where, you know, people are always shooting at him, but he, he doesn't actually get, get shot. You know, we've got this invulnerability which is being broken by what's happened here with coronavirus and secondly the speed of response i mean in in the uk here basically within a space of three days about a third of the economy was shut down so the data in the paper this morning is that 75 percent of people are actually now at home not working doing anything and a third of the economy or more is is just stopped now as you say for for climate change we do not want this this is not what the solution to climate change is about people were afraid i think people were very afraid of what uh, if they agreed with climate change they'd be very afraid of what this meant in terms of for them and the economy and everything but let's be clear even at the moment we're requiring a high rate of reduction of CO2 emissions. We're talking about reducing CO2 emissions by 8% a year, I think is the, is the target figure. So that means, what's that mean? It means, it means shutting down 8% of the fossil fuel parts of the economy, which is only a part of the economy per year. And that's a tiny amount compared with, with shutting down a third of the whole economy and you know, 75% of the people being at home. It, it, it's minor. And so that, I think, is, gives people a sense of, well, what can be done if we decided um, we need to do it? And the third point, which we've implicitly covered, is, is really listening to, listening to scientists. And instead of saying, oh, well, thank you very much, now go back in your, go back in your box, yeah? <laughs> Let's actually take note of what you're saying. And of course, that's another point with the, with the um, coronavirus, which is that it's, what's come out is that scientists have been talking in theory about the almost certainty of there being a pandemic of some sort because that's the way things are there's almost certainty of being a pandemic when there is because of the nature of air travel it will go all over the world and and some of those some of those pre-preparedness of plans clearly um were not put in were not put in place so that in the uk we're, we're struggling with personal protection equipment, which is a, which is a basic of, of um, the reality of dealing with a lot of people who are incredibly ill in a way that we've never seen people this ill before, because never before have the health professionals been exposed to catching the de disease from the patients uh, at such a high level in the UK. Now, Charles, we really should talk about one of the solutions that you're very passionate about, planting a billion trees. Um, a trillion trees, please, Gary. Trillion, trees, trillion, trillion. Yeah. Um, this is something of it, look, I, I'm not sure, Heather, you saw that internet sensation where uh, a YouTuber said he'll plant three trees for five pounds. Were you, were you around with that? Now, mm -hmm. when Charles got hold of that information, he said, well, that's, that's inflated price. I can do that far cheaper. Charles, tell us about how we can... Um, with very little money, plant lots of trees and still save um, a family and a family's income. That's something well, we could really do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, let's come back to a question to, to Heather about Woods Hole after this. But um, yeah, I mean, basically at uh, noco2.org, we, we plant trees. So basically we take your, your donation, we plant trees, we plant a lot of trees, and if you plant enough trees, then you will go, you will go carbon neutral. So the, the idea is instead of planting a few, just a few trees, we plant trees absolutely in bulk, and these trees are planted in Madagascar and Indonesia, and it's not expensive. So that's, that's the fundamentals of it. And the, what's really important is we've got the circular economy coming in here where for every 100 trees planted, it creates a day's work, for people who are in extreme poverty and because the trees are being planted uh, in perpetuity then it's creating uh, an environment for, for wildlife for birds and animals to live in as well but i have to say here that one of the things that, that really um it inspired me about this vision was the work of Woods Hole Research because I think it was through one of the um, the notes in the IPC paper annexes 
that I came across Woods Hole Research Centre and your 2016 paper, which is to my mind so important here because it basically says that there are 500,000 hectares of land worldwide which are available, which have been deforested and could be replanted. And that uh, if they were replanted, then, then that amount of land would basically remove 10% of CO2 emissions by the world every year that the trees are growing. So if the trees are growing for 25 years, then it's 10% of world emissions for 25 years or, or 30 years or however long the trees are growing for. So, you know, it, it's, it's one off. I mean, once the trees have reached steady state, then they keep growing, but they, they're not absorbing additional CO2 emissions. But for me, that was such an important paper. So, I mean, Heather, I'm really, really interested in, in where you are now with this. That paper was a few years ago. So where are you? Any updates on that? Any, how are yeah. these numbers changing? Absolutely. Um, the numbers are changing. Our understanding is changing all of the time. And I think a couple of really important numbers to call out in what you were saying and points to make. I mean, since uh, that paper and that work you were talking about from 2015, 2016, um, we have seen an explosion of interest. And I think really particularly in, in uh, recent months here in the U.S., we've seen an explosion of interest in this idea of planting trees as a climate solution. And I think um, you know, as, as researchers, one thing that our scientists at Woods Hole Research Center are always trying to do is look really realistically, objectively, um, and factually at the, the claims and objectives of these different types of, of programs. And I think uh, along those lines, calling out what you were saying, you know, that, that replanting the, the work from 2015 saying, okay, there's this area that if we were to reforest it could absorb 10%, 10%. Now, that's important but it also leaves another 90% of the work to do. And I think there has been in the enthusiasm to um, adopt this solution, there's sometimes um, a big picture that is, is missed and, and, and there's the thought that, oh, we can plant our way out of this. All we have to do is plant trees. And I think what we have to recognize about tree planting is that while it is absolutely essential um, it, what our science at Woods Hole Research Center shows us is that there really isn't a solution to climate change without forests, um, but that they are not in any way wholly adequate on their own. We have to be cutting fossil fuel emissions. Forests, no matter how much planting we do, cannot keep up with, um, you know, continually and unlimitedly expanding greenhouse gas emissions. So it's really important, um, but it's not the whole solution. And I think the other thing that, that often gets lost in this conversation is that planting trees where we have lost forest or where we have uh, unused cropland, that sort of thing is important. But what is at least as important is preserving the forests that we still have standing. Because in fact, those are already absorbing carbon now you know, when you plant new trees, you've got to wait decades for those trees to catch up to the rate of, and the amount of carbon absorption that standing forests are already doing. And those standing forests are also, as you mentioned, they're, they're ecosystems. They are habitat for other plants and animals. They are uh, regulating the flow of water through the landscape. They are performing all sorts of other functions that newly planted trees don't because they're not a mature ecosystem yet. And so those standing forests are a climate solution right now and preserving them is, is um, really, really important. So we can't think about planting trees to the expense of ignoring our deforestation uh, problems. We have to really be cutting back on deforestation and then thinking about planting those trees as well. The way I see it though, um, Heather, is that they're, they're, very different, they're very different skill sets. And um, the people who are planting trees, um, you know, we, we all read the same, um, the same UNFCC and IPCC reports, but the what's required for each is, is massively different. So, you know, I've built up um, some understanding of the tree planting side of it. I, I find the deforestation, the stopping deforestation, I, I find that's incredibly frustrating and incredibly confusing because you know there's there's people out there there's there's individuals out there who are um collectively going out and saying right well we want to you know we're, we're 
economically we're in a bad situation so therefore we want to take over some rainforest and plant something and grow stuff here so you've got people like that but then also i think you've got the the agro forest the agro um, in the massive um industrial um, agriculture um, companies who are going in on and doing this on an industrial scale so there's there's some, some very complicated things in there in terms of the solutions so do, do you have any do you have any sort of easy easy to understand insights into you know any what we what we should be doing to, to stop this deforestation which is just so frustrating right i mean i can't claim to have an easy solution for deforestation um if i did i would probably be doing something very different right now <laughs> um but uh, two things on that point i think first of all yes there are choices that we as individuals as consumers can make every day um, in terms of what we purchase and understanding that what we purchase drives demand um, for things like the crops um, that are grown or the beef that is grown so if we talk about the amazon and what is driving deforestation it's um, largely beef uh, production and soy production um, so thinking about your choices we also know that eating red meat um, has one of the, the highest carbon footprint of, of any food. So perhaps that means on an individual level, choosing to forego uh, you know, red meat once a week or cutting back in some way on your red meat consumption, right? So there are individual choices that we can make, but I think to your point, absolutely, there are many parts of the climate crisis that will not be addressed simply by individual action. We are going to need large collective action. We're going to need uh, state, federal, and international policy and coordination to address this. Um, so there are, in, in that regard, I guess the, the individual action is to um, be pressing your elected officials on these issues and, and pushing them to engage in those sorts of policies. I would also say that in terms of solutions for some of these thorny problems around deforestation, I mean, that's something that our scientists at Woods Hole Research Center are also working on. And one really interesting study that came out uh, just a couple of months ago um, highlighted the fact that, that deforestation policy or forest protection policy um, really intersects, as you've kind of alluded to, Charles, with issues of social justice. And then in particular in the Amazon, um, while uh, lands that are held by uh, indigenous groups there do see some carbon emissions. It tends to be from illegal activity and that in fact, the emissions from uh, land held by indigenous groups is far lower. And so one of the recommendations coming out of that work is that one of the best things that we can do for preserving uh, Amazon forests and the carbon that they absorb and hold is to support the sovereignty and the rights of indigenous groups, um, which, you know, it, sometimes uh, we hear about a solution and something that we need to do and, and it feels like uh, climate solutions need to involve sacrifice of some sort. And to me, that was just such an amazing thing for the science to come out and say, no, the, the solution here, part of the solution here is just doing the right thing and supporting um, the sovereignty of indigenous peoples and, and their ability to preserve and, and restore forests. Yeah, yeah, this is an understanding I've come to just over the last year, but certainly in the, I mean, Gary, I don't know what your experience is, but the, in, in the UK, there are really not a lot of Brazilian goods on the shelves. I mean, at one, while, at one time there was some Brazilian wine, there are Brazilian, occasionally there's Brazilian grapes, but, um, you know, we don't have, I'm not aware that you've got Brazilian label beef. I mean, that may be incorporated into other things, but, you know, beef, beef here is normally labeled as, as um, British or Scottish or, you know, Irish. Argentinian, um, Argentinian beef is, is very... You've got that in your area, have you? Not around, not around here, Gary. <laughs> around here. I, do you know what I love, Heather, is your holistic approach to because we, we um charles and i have got the privilege of speaking to so many people and they tend to have a solution which is their specialty whether it be electric cars or whether it be deforestation or you you're looking at this at a really holistic level is there any areas that you you want to concentrate on more that you're not quite sure about because you you really uh, you're cut for me this is honestly you're one of the most holistic um, scientist I've spoken to that really looks at each part of the solution and looks at that bigger picture, which is what we need. 
I guess for me, the way that I look at it, and part of this came um, out of years as a journalist where I was speaking to public audiences and there's a, a, a thirst and a hunger for what do I do to solve this, right? Because I think we were talking about this a little bit earlier, the, the recognition of your vulnerability and collectively of our vulnerability that we've gotten from this pandemic. Um, one thing we know from social scientists and psychologists is that a certain level of fear can be motivating. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, you pass another tipping point. <laughs> um, and that fear can become overwhelming and paralyzing if it's not paired with a message of action. And Charles, you showed us that really clear leaflet that you got in the mail that said, this is what we do to do our part in fighting COVID-19. And we haven't gotten that um, for climate change in part because it's a really big problem with a lot of different pieces. And I guess I'm a, a glass half full type of person. Some people go, you know, we need that one silver bullet to solve climate change and we don't have it, therefore it's too much. And I look at that and say, the fact that there's no one overarching right solution doesn't mean there's nothing we can do. It means there's a huge array of things we can do, all of which are right. They're not the whole thing, but each of them is right. So that's restoring forests, that's also planting trees, that's changing our consumer habits. And so for me as a journalist, uh, being in a position where, you know, I'm, I, and, and, and also, you know, now from a position within the science community, it's, it's not necessarily my job to tell you, Gary, how to live your life and you, Charles, how to live your life. But what I see in climate change is an opportunity for all of us to reconnect with our personal values and figure out what is the right, at least first step, maybe it won't be the last step, to take in addressing climate change. So does it have to do with your diet? Does it have to do with transportation or your home? Um, there are so many different ways that climate change intersects with our lives that we have a lot of different opportunities to find the solutions that are right for us. And uh, as you, Gary and Charles both know, um, I'm in the midst of moving from one home to another home just across town. Um, in some regards, our new home is, is not up to where we were in terms of our efforts to get ourselves as a family more resilient off grid. But in part, the move was motivated by the fact that we're now closer into town and all three of my children will be able to walk or bike to school, will be able to bike or walk to the grocery store, to the library, to playgrounds. It will be easier for my husband and I to get to work that way, right? So that's a choice that for us felt really right as a family to be engaging in more active transportation um, was really important to us. And so I think there's there are opportunities like that for people to find the, the piece of the puzzle that's right for them. And then I think another really important thing that we've learned from psychological research is that small successes actually create motivation to do more. So I, I really push back against the idea that there's any action that is too small to start with when it comes to climate change. No, changing your light bulbs will not solve the problem. But if changing the light bulbs is a first step that gets you thinking about, oh, well, that wasn't so hard. What more could I do? Then I think it's an amazing first place to start. Yeah. I think you hit well, the nail on the head with fear of loss. Is not, it doesn't have a longevity of opportunity for gain with motivating people. The cream of motivating human beings is changing the world. So we just need to gamify it. We need to have some kind of checklist, like you said. And I love, love the way you, you answered that question. Thank you. Charles. Yeah, so I mean, uh, Heather, really appreciate the fact you can walk to places in the US. And my experience of the US, you know, w walking is a pretty low priority. Uh, where, where, um, where Gary lives, I mean. This pandemic can change that because apparently, um, a handful of cities, including Boston, the city closest to me, um, have been experimenting with closing some streets to allow more pedestrian traffic, more space, so that people can be out and walking and biking while observing social distancing. So maybe one of those silver linings of people getting a taste of what a more uh, pedestrian-friendly transportation system would, would be like, would feel like.
Mm. But where, uh, where Gary lives, because I, I normally go to Gary's studio, which is behind him. Um, but uh, where Gary lives, I mean, Gary lives a short walk from a station on the most amazing public transport network probably in the world, which is uh, the, the London Underground system. So, you know, you can, you can in normal times, you can, uh, you can travel anywhere very efficiently by that. But in terms of what people can do, I mean, for me, the, the, the really big thing that comes to the top of the pile is, is really, it's, it's, it's up to people to choose. Mm. And so we've, we've got this choice in front of each of us. And, and the choice is very straightforward that we, we carry on as we are, you know, we just carry on as, as things are, we carry on in the normal way. And the scientists are saying that global warming, we will have three to four degrees of, of global warming, which is absolutely massive catastrophic crisis point, because they say we need to have two degrees maximum and ideally one and a half degrees so three to four degrees is is massive and basically we end up wrecking the planet the future of our children our wildlife and all the rest or the choice is actually to, just to make that choice in really make that commitment to say look i want to stop global warming and it's as simple as that once people have really made that fundamental choice then a whole load of differences roll out of that so i mean gary you were you going to do a, a, a poll at some stage on yeah. on this but yeah that, the, that our was, audience our audience is online our audience is here so uh let's see we've got a poll um so that's, that's the fundamentals and then having made that choice then there's things that um that basically can, people can people can do from that and the, and the first one i would say is really just to to be aware, to be aware of your CO2 emissions. As, as I totally agree with, with Heather that planting trees is, um, is, is not gonna solve it. It's gonna buy us time and it can buy us a lot of time because um, you know, trees planted in the tropics um, really start to, uh, to absorb CO2 pretty quickly as I understand it. Um, so the first thing to do is to, is to be aware of it and then to, to start to do something about it. Definitely. So Gary, Yes, our audience are on social media, not necessarily in this room. So um, that poll, uh, you can answer it for yourselves. You can answer it on social media. Um, that so that that was good, but we didn't quite. Uh, the question is, will the action we take today be enough to um, directly impact the climate change? So, a hundred percent have said too little. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you're talking like, about the actions we've already taken today, right. then that, that definitely is true. But uh, yeah, I mean, certainly there's there's lots of opportunity, and we are not going to um, stop. Or, and I think this is also really important for people to realize. And maybe we've learned from uh, this pandemic, we're not going to undo what has already. Uh, happened and what has already changed in our climate system. And, and Charles, you mentioned those projected levels of warming and, and the targets, you know, important to realize that we're already at one degree Celsius or a little over one degree Celsius of total average global warming from pre-industrial conditions. So if we're talking about trying to limit it to one and a half, we're two thirds of the way there already. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, in a very short time to, to try to hit those kinds of goals. And young people are so passionate about this and uh, they really want to do something. And it seems that there's a, there's, a, there's a power shift because the guys in charge, us, don't seem to be acting quick enough. They're, it's really their planet. They're the next ones to have this. So we, we have a responsibility to our children to make sure that they come into a, a, an, an amazing world that we, we once enjoyed and we do enjoy. Now, I often go to schools, I do talks to young people, and, they, and I say, do your passion, children. Uh, follow what you really love. And they say, but sir, how will I know what I'm passionate about? And I say, well, time will fly. We only have nine minutes left to the hour. And I can't, but I can't, it's felt like five minutes. I don't know about you, you both. If I were to give you a, a, a magic wand, Heather, and you could have three wishes, environmental wishes, and uh, do you think that you could translate that and just there's your wand you can you can hand that over what would you wave and ask for oh wow um i guess the the first and biggest um would be social justice wow because i think that if we were to give 
uh, more power to the people who have not had it, um, that many of the other problems would fall into place. We know that um, small island developing nations are already seeing sea level rise eat away at their coastlines and at their fresh water. Uh, they were the ones at the Paris climate talks in 2015 demanding that the goal be one and a half degrees uh, limit, not two degrees, because they recognized that even two was far too dangerous um, for them. And their voices were heard and we, we ended up with that more stringent goal um, in the Paris Climate Accord. So that's a really big one. And maybe that takes all three of my wishes. I don't know. That has but surprised me, but it that makes That power shift great. would be huge. Um, the second is a little bit more nuts and bolts. Um, but it's a major shift in our economic system and not putting all of the responsibility on consumers to pick and choose is this Brazilian beef, was this causing deforestation, what is the carbon footprint of this problem, but instead um, embedding the price of carbon in our economic system. Because the reality is that as much as we talk about the economic trade-offs and what it will cost to address climate change, um, any money that we spend on climate change the damages, if we don't take those actions, will cost far, far more. So we're not talking about that economic trade-off in a way that's fair. I think we've seen with this pandemic um, a realization that, oh, sometimes you have to incur huge costs to avoid even bigger costs in terms of human lives. And that's really what we're talking about with climate change as well. So we need to embed the cost of carbon in our I economy. Really and, didn't prep you for and you've answered it so logically. You're incredible. And the one more, one last wish. I get one last wish. Oh, um, well, I'll throw one of my favorites out there. You know, more active transportation, just because it is, mm. at least for me, it's just such a joy to be outside, moving our bodies, being in the natural environment. Um, I would love for that to be part of, of everybody's um, solution to climate change. Okay. Well, Gary, for me, the, you know, I've shown this little leaflet already. I, I think that I'd like to see governments across the world translating the emergency into this sort of very simple message and action limit action thing. And, and you know, to go on the front page, it, it's got to be re reduce your CO2 emissions. It's got to be one of the, the action points on here. Yeah. yeah? Um, so that that one for me. Secondly, um, the you know when when Trump decided that um, he he he's going to pull America out of the um, Paris Agreement, people said, oh well, it's not that a big deal because you know half of America, the states like California and New York, are, are sort of staying in the Paris Agreement anyway. But like he's like he's actually done on coronavirus. I mean, he I think it's pretty clear. Um, he did change his mind on coronavirus, and, and I would like him to change his mind on um, on climate. And the the what he actually said, he didn't say he didn't agree that climate change wasn't happening. What he said is that the 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 economics weren't right. It wasn't right for the, it was going to cost America too much. And uh, I'd like to see him um, change his mind on that because I think that would be uh, really good, or or have his mind changed for him. Let's put it that way. And then I, I'm totally with um, I'm totally with Heather on the, the point about embedding the cost of, of carbon into into um, products because that way people are going to see the difference they're going to see the impact and um, just on that one in the UK if you are watching from the UK then we we have this ability here to basically switch and choose your electricity supplier. So if you're with a um, standard, one of the big six electricity suppliers, you can actually um, change to a green electricity supplier. So all your electricity then is comes from uh, renewables, and that that if if enough people do that, that makes a that makes a huge difference. So as as part of that one, but the um, embedding the carbon carbon tax or or whatever you call it is critically important because then people are going to see. They're going to see the cost of it. And if you're not aware of it, there is a proposal from Citizens Climate Lobby, which is a, um, which is a worldwide proposal, which is that actually um, you get a rebate back so that you don't pay, the average user does not pay 
the the tax they, they they pay the money out but they get a rebate so that at the end of the day the only people who pay are the big are the big users of carbon people who um, people who use a lot so those are my perfect points gary love that uh, heather on your podcast you interviewed 800 people you did a a kind of your at the end one the last one you did a, a snapshot of all your favorite interviews and i think this will probably be it definitely will get in the hall of fame when we get to 800 you interviewed somebody who does mindfulness and i'm and uh, this this question that you asked him um it quite it, it meant something you said well how has mindfulness changed in the last 25 30 years and he said not really not, it's still the same and i think that people will be talking about the environment and we'll still be saying there's the same solutions but i certainly would would like um, you to come back. I think we should we should make, extend the invitation after this coronavirus has come, and then we we can look at some data how things changed. I, that would be amazing. Um, you have been such a delight to to be with, and uh, your presence and your energy and your passion, all of that comes across, and you you explain things so well. Charles, I, I'll let you wrap up. There, we have two minutes left, sir. Well, thank you so much, Heather. Thank you, Gary, for uh, organising this, and thank you, Gary, for the great idea of let's uh, let's have a um, let's have another session. Um, I would just say that if anybody's been inspired by this to to do something, then do please think about um, making the choice to stop global warming first of all. If you are doing that, then start to reduce your CO2 emissions for the reasons that um, Heather has said. And thirdly, do think about planting some trees. We're all creating a lot of CO2 emissions. We can all do something about it. We can all plant some trees. Personally, I've planted three and a half thousand trees, which remove 14 tons of CO2 per year. If you're from the US, then you need to plant a few more. You need to plant 4,000 trees on average. And obviously some people need to plant even more. But um, it's n0co2.org and all the money goes to um, planting trees. And that money, most of it goes to people from extreme poverty who plant the trees. So thank you very much. I'm going to dive. I'm going to watch this again. I enjoyed it so much. Heather, uh, we should give you the last word before we wrap up. Well, thank you both so much uh, for having me on the podcast. It's, it's been a real joy. Great. Well, everyone have a safe day and um, we'll get back to you with more updates. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you.